An ideology has crept in and told women who to be compassionate towards and who not to care about. So, okay, so your point fundamentally is that, I believe, is that the, the ideology specifies the victim-victimizer dimension and identifies the victim. Now, do you think, do you think it's, so when we, when, when we, when we did our study, it was agreeable. I said it was being female and having a female temperament. Those were both predictors. We never saw that in any study we ever did, looking at what predicted beliefs, for example. If, generally, if we controlled for temperament, sex had no effect. But that wasn't the case in this specific situation, which, which I thought was extremely telling. And so, and it's also very interesting, as you pointed out, that it's young women in particular. And I can't help, as someone, you know, psychoanalytically influenced, I can't help but think that a fair chunk of this is misplaced maternal instinct. I, I believe that the young women who are, in, by and large, childless in the years when they shouldn't be, are unbelievably sensitive. Well, let's talk about what happened in 2004. You know, you said that's when women started to shift their political priorities. Now, I know from people who've been investigating this that um, TikTok is a particularly pernicious influence, especially with regards to the campus protests that are occurring right now. And the TikTok short videos that are fostering the, the campus protests, at least among women, focus on compassion for the war victims to, to, to the ultimate degree, and they seem to be extraordinarily effective. But there's a real problem here that needs to be wrestled with, because if it is the case that young women are differentially sensitive to a certain kind of propaganda, and they often, and they also increasingly occupy the majority positions in uh, university institutions, for example, then we have a whole new kind of social problem on our hands. Because we've never had, it's only been in the last 30 years that we've had the opportunity to see what female dominant large institutions would look like, right? That's historically unprecedented. We have no idea what pathologies or advantages those systems might have. So what do you think happened in 2004? Like, why did the tide start to turn then? So my interpret there's other data sort data series that we can see changing. So political donations shifting towards the Democrats, for example, around roughly the same time. Now, political donations come for people who are highly educated, relatively well off, for example. I think what, what happens in the US anyway is you get George W. Bush, who's more of a populist, not an elite style conservative, who's just about tax and spend, for example. And I actually think you see, you know, he's also to some degree advancing the agenda of the religious right to some degree. I think this populist style cultural conservatism doesn't work as well with the elite opinion formers, and so they start to drift away in terms of political donations. And the, the if you like the kind of background, the ambient noise, the mood music that is coming through the elite institutions, the schools, the culture, just starts to turn against uh, Republicans and conservatism, for example. So I actually think women are a kind of, ref they kind of reflect what is the dominant ethos in a society, or at least at the prestige ethos in a society. So if we actually swung the ethos against wokeism, I think women would be in the forefront of that. Uh, I don't think there's anything biological. So I mean, I am a so more of a sociologist and a, and a political scientist. So I tend to approach these things from a kind of sociology of emotions perspective, which says that ideas can tell you which emotions to turn off and which emotions to express. And now, of course, that's refracted through things like gender. So in this case, I think women will just back up and reinforce the dominant values, dominant ideology of the elites in a society. Um, so I'm not as convinced... Why the elites? Why do you think it's... Okay, why would women specifically back up the dominant ideology of the elites? Do you think that's a consequence of something like hypergamy? Or what's your, what's your theory about that? Because it's weird, if they're also standing up from the, for the underdogs, is it that they accept the elite differentiation of who's an underdog and who's a power monger? And then, and, 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 and then why is that associated with, with youth, let's say, with, with women? I'm trying to disentangle all that. Well, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, one is the education system, uh, which I think shifts in this direction in a big way. I mean, it was there in a few radical centers like Berkeley and the Toronto District School Board, <laughs> Greater London yeah. Council. Yeah. So you, <laughs> you had these crazy places. 
But what's happened is a scaling up. So what my book talks a lot about is these ideas actually go back quite a long way, but it's the scaling up. Now it's in every school. So I did a couple of studies with the Man Manhattan Institute. You know, 90% of 18 to 20 year old Americans that I interviewed, you know, sent the survey to, said that they had encountered at least one critical race theory concept from an adult in school. In, in Britain, it was about, you know, it was a majority as well. Not as high, but a majority. So it's, sat it's hitting saturation level. So that's what women are getting in class. And then they see it in the institutions that may be in the workplace, uh, in the government. So they, they're seeing this thing, DEI, everywhere. And so they think, yeah, this is the way you have to be a good moral person. And they simply reinforce those values.